So the Ukraine situation is completely out of control. But I want you to know it's part of a plan. It's part of Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. Cecil Rhodes was Fabian Society. And Cecil Rhodes, the Rhodes Scholar, put in Bill Clinton and many, many others. Obama is probably a CIA creation, but they're still part of that entire network of bad people. So I put together a video I'd like you to watch that from clips I've saved from 2014, uh, once from 2013, and I put them together in a way that hopefully makes this make sense. So take a little bit of time. It's kind of a long video, but I think if you're curious about what's going on in Ukraine, or if you have some dum-dums in your life, who have a blue and yellow thing on their Twitter and on their YouTube, you might want to share it with them because they're being misled. And they're being misled at the detriment, literally, of hundreds of thousands of people on both Ukrainian and the Russian side. So many people have died and been displaced that it's actually really tragic, which is why I'm doing this, because it pisses me off. And I hope, at least for the record, somewhere, there's some truth to be said about this. But make no mistake, the depopulation agenda is underway, and this is just one other piece of the puzzle. So sit back, take a look. I'd like to know what you think in the comments. I've got some clips, and i got a little more commentary later. And uh, God, peace be with you, man. I hope things are good. All right. The recent scenes of violence between the government and opposition forces in Ukraine look like a war zone with two armies going head to head. The visuals reflect a deepening divide that's pulling Ukraine in two different directions. One toward Russia. We need all our influence to make this country a peace and peace. The other toward Western Europe. We call on all sides to put an end to violence immediately. Faced with this division, President Viktor Yanukovych has chosen Russia. Here's some background on a divide with few easy answers. On the Russian side, Vladimir Putin has strong influence over Mr. Yanukovych. The two men have met repeatedly since the beginning of the protests. Putin promised billions in aid to Ukraine and with the extended economic lifeline, Yanukovych continued to crack down on pro-Western activists at home. Russia has a variety of ways to exert influence. Alexander Motil, a professor of political science and specialist on Ukraine, explains. So it's the relationship between a big country and a small, lish, relatively smaller neighbor. Ukraine is highly dependent on Russia for natural gas, and without that natural gas, much of the economy would come to a halt. Russia has a military base in Ukraine, so there is this kind of weird relationship there as well. Ми не бачимо зараз волі чинної влади, чинного президента до реального вирішення цього політичного жахливого політичного. Це вже навіть не політичний. Це знаєте, це такий людський конфлікт. Here's the geographical reality. This is Ukraine, with protests centered in Kiev. Through the lens of voting in the 2010 elections, two Ukraines are visible. In the West, there are mostly Ukrainian speakers who lean towards Europe. In that election, they opted for Yulia Tymoshenko. Mr. Yanukovych's now imprisoned rival. In the East, there's a predominantly Russian-speaking population. This is Mr. Yanukovych's base, with citizens there that are generally more wary of European Union integration. While the majority of protesters in Independence Square are from the West, many have also traveled to Kiev from the East. If you look at the two extremes, the two poles, then you do find two very different Ukrainians. The East supports Yanukovych, the West detests him. The space between the Far East and the Far West is occupied by, a ter you know, by territories, provinces, peoples, cultures, which evince gradations. But it's being condoned by the European Union in Washington as events unfold. 
And when you say the, the Western countries will bear some responsibility, in what sense do they bear responsibility? I mean, clearly there's been an effort by the United States and Europe ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union to pull the former Soviet states clo uh, into their economic sphere. But uh, how, is that the way you're talking about it? I mean that. I mean that Moscow... Here's, look at it through Moscow's eyes. Since the Clinton administration in the 1990s, the U.S.-led West has been on a steady march toward post-Soviet Russia, began with the expansion of NATO in the 1990s under Clinton. Bush then further expanded NATO all the way to Russia's borders. Then came the funding of what are euphemistically called NGOs, but they are political action groups funded by the West, operating inside Russia. Then came the decision to build missile defense installations along Russia's borders, allegedly against Iran a country which has neither nuclear weapons nor any missiles to deliver them with. Then comes American military outpost in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, which led to the War of 208. And now the West is at the gates of Ukraine. So that's the picture as Moscow sees it. And it's rational, it's reasonable, it's hard to deny. But as for the immediate crisis, let's ask ourselves this. Who precipitated this crisis? Uh, the American media says it was Putin and the very bad, though democratically elected, president of Ukraine, Yanukovych. But it was the European Union, backed by Washington, that said in November to the democratically elected president of a profoundly divided country, Ukraine, you must choose between Europe and Russia. That was an ultimatum to Yanukovych. Remember, was it reported here, at that moment, what did the much despised Putin say? He said, why? Why does Ukraine have to choose? We are prepared to help Ukraine avoid economic collapse along with you, the West. Let's make it a tripartite package to Ukraine. And it was rejected in Washington and in Brussels. That precipitated the protests in the streets. And since then, the dy dynamic that any of us who have ever witnessed these kinds of struggles in the streets unfolded as extremists have taken control of the movement from the so-called moderate Ukrainian leaders. I mean, posted on the internet. The comments are attributed to the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Karen Newland, who met President Yanukovych and opposition leaders separately in Kiev on Thursday. The date and precise context of the recording are not known. Newland and the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, discuss which of the country's opposition leaders they'd like to see in government, and they refer to getting the U.N. involved. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the U.N. help glue it and, you know, f*** the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it does, if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. The video has a transcript in Russian. The U.S. State Department said it didn't know where the recording came from, but it criticized Moscow for publicizing it while being suitably contrite towards the EU. We work incredibly closely with the EU and with representatives of the EU, and Assistant Secretary Newland certainly does as it relates to Ukraine, and she's been in close contact with uh, EU High Representative Ashton. Also, let me convey that uh, she has been in contact with her EU counterparts and, and of course, uh, has apologized. Well, I, look, uh, obviously Putin has his mission and he clearly does see himself in the way that Professor Cohen just outlined. But here's the thing, you know, obviously there's been, uh, you know, a major sort of argument over Ukraine. But Putin and the Russians have by treaty their big Black Sea fleet in Sebastopol in the Crimea. Uh, there was no indication that the new Ukrainian government uh, was going to change that reality at all. And you say that Putin has telegraphed, you know, what his aims are and that he's not a thug. Well, look, I would like you to explain to me how he and us can justify the trumping up of this hysteria in the Crimea, which has given the Russians the ability to do what they're doing, whether it was well, the trumped up change of government in the, in the Crimean parliament, whether it was the trumped up call by this government for uh, Russians right. to come in and protect them when they were not being killed, Professor Cohen, there was no violence in the Crimea, whether it was the horrendous, and I've done a lot of reporting on hate speech and nationalistic speech and on incitement to war and hatred and the uh, state Russian media is very bad ahead, right Professor now Cohen. on this. No, no, this is the facts. And now you have the Duma uh, debating right. an annexation law. 
All of this is trumped up to provide Putin with what you say, and that is his uh, desire to, to protect their interests and to keep his sphere of influence. Professor Cohen. The extremism didn't come from Russia. It was coming from Western Ukraine. We've left the large part of the story out. There's a small but resolute and determined right-wing nationalist movement in Ukraine. It's quasi fascist and it is dictating terms to this parliament in Kiev, which is not legitimate in law, international or constitutional. This parliament, which is a rump parliament because they banned the two majority parties that represented the East, have been passing anti-Russian uh, legislation. They ban the use of Russian as an official language. It isn't Russia that's been spewing this ideological destabilizing uh, message. It's been coming from the West. And here the worst part is that has been that hatred has been supported by Washington and Brussels in embracing this West Ukrainian movement. That, will, that must stop. Okay, so take notice here how uh, Wolf Blitzer says that we're out of time as soon as the good professor starts speaking the truth. We're up against the clock, uh, unfortunately, but uh, to be continued. An excellent conversation, uh, Professor Cohen. Christiana Amanpour, thanks very much. And on that last point, you heard Vitaly Cherkin, the Russian ambassador to the UN Security Council, saying earlier today that at, at fault for all of this are what he called fascists and anti-Semites in Ukraine right now. To be you continued. know, you've got to be really careful putting that across as a, as a fact. That's what Vitaly Cherkin. He that, may have done. That's what he but said. That is the Russian position. He may have that's done. That's what I was but pointing out. Are you out. telling me? Are you saying that the entire pro-European Ukrainians are anti-Semites? That is what Christian, the Russians are saying. That's what the Russians are saying. saying. What Vitaly that's Cherkin, what the Russians are he saying. Said, and that's what heard Professor Cohen is saying. Professor Cohen say it, and I was just pointing out that a Russian right. official at the United Nations today <laughs> said, "What's it? What? Who's responsible for all of this?" fascists and anti-Semites in Ukraine. Am I saying right. that? No, I'm not. But I am saying that that's what Vitaly Cherkin said. Right, and, and have we have to be bite. very careful. We'll play it for you. We played it not for you to, No, no, I hour. heard it. Yeah. I heard it. We just, as a network, have to be really careful not to lump the entire pro-European Ukrainians into what we're some not. may I'm well not. be, which are nationalistic we're, and, uh, and, and, and extremist. Christian, so that's what not, I'm saying. Hey, guys, do, I'm, not, I'm an outsider. We're not doing I, that I hate all. to see a civil war break out it's on CNN. It's not a civil war. So take a look at this Victoria Newland character. She is a baby boomer halfwit with an ideology that is evil. Watch when she speaks. Watch her eyes. She's lying and she knows it. She's blinking like blinking is uh, she's getting paid to blink. It's horrific. And when you watch her and you see the clips of her, this is a bad person. And she is caused a responsible directly and indirectly but partially directly for tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dead bodies so when you see these people in your life and they use that baiting language where they want to manipulate and control and guide you we got to say no just flat no that's probably my favorite word in the english language no well there's others but it's not that kind of stream so um yeah <laughs> So anyway, thank you guys for watching. I'm done. I'm just going to play the rest of this. And I hope you got something out of this. And I'd like to know what you think in the comments. Okay, take care. I have no doubt after our meeting that President Yanukovych knows what he needs to do. The whole world is watching. We want to see a better future for Ukraine. I made it absolutely clear to him that what happened last night, what has been happening in security terms here, is absolutely impermissible in a European state, in a democratic state. The United States stands with you in your search for justice, for human dignity, for security, for economic health, and for the European future that you have chosen and that you deserve. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, f the EU. While Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland's comment about the EU dominated the news headlines uh, because she used a curse, there were several other very interesting parts of her conversation with the U U.S. Uh, ambassador to Ukraine. Let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep—I I think we want to try to get somebody within international personality to— 
um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deeds yeah, to stick. Okay. So Biden's willing. That's the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Piat, uh, speaking with Victoria Nuland. The significance of what she is saying, she also had gone to Ukraine and was feeding protesters on the front line. Cookies. Cookies. Well, here we get, here again. The American political media establishment, including the right and the left and the center, because they're all complicit in this nonsense, focused on the too sensational, they thought, aspect of that leaked conversation. She said, F the European Union. And everybody said, oh my God, she said the word. The other thing was, who leaked it? Oh, it was the Russians. Those dirty Russians leaked this conversation. But the significance is what you just played. What are they doing? The highest ranking State Department official, who presumably represents the Obama administration, and the American ambassador in Kiev are, to put it in blunt terms, plotting a coup d'etat against the elected president of Ukraine. Now, that said, Amy, Juan, you may say to me, neither of you would, but hypothetically, that's a good thing. We don't like this. We don't care if he was elected democratically. He's a rat. He's corrupt. And he is all those things. He is. Let's depose him. That's what the United States should do. Then the United States should stand up and say, that's what we do. We get rid of bad guys. We assassinate them and we overthrow them. But in Washington and Brussels, they lie. They're talking about democracy now. They're not talking about democracy now. They're talking about a coup now. Well, okay, just one more quick thing. Just one more thing. Stephen Cohen from New York University was the only man that I saw in this entire thing they had any kind of rationality or common sense or truth telling about this I don't know where he is today but I hope he's doing well because he tried and that's all we can do is try try to tell the truth be honorable you know give a shit about your fellow human beings so anyway carry on we should we American citizens should be allowed to choose which policy we want, but they conceal it from us. And I'm extremely angry that the people in this country who say they deplore this sort of thing have fallen silent. Let's listen to a little bit more of the leaked conversation between the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, and Victoria Nuland, the top U.S. diplomat for Europe. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Boak and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I'm I, kind of... I, I, I just I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. That was uh, Victoria Nuland, the top U.S. diplomat for Europe, speaking with Jeffrey Piat, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the Ukraine. Uh, Stephen Cohen, this uh, uh, this me, chess man. game, what this chess game that they're conducting here. Explain <laughs> the names. Who is Klitsch? Yats. 